This is uh, Raymond Lotta. I want to welcome everyone to our special program today from Revolution Books Online. Um, I see our guest, Andy Worthington. Maybe you can um, shake your head if you can hear me, then I'll know the audience is hearing me. All right. So uh, this is the official beginning and uh, welcome to our international audience. Today's special program is America's Torture Colony, Guantanamo, 19 years of Guantanamo. It must be closed now. Our speakers today are Andy Worthington, who since 2006 has exposed the barbarous conditions at Guantanamo and also brought to international attention the life stories of those who have been taken, those who have been detained there, and those who have tragically died there. Uh, Andy is a writer, and he also um, is a multi-threat talent who's a musician as well. Um, our other guest uh, today is Shelby Sullivan Dennis, who uh, is a lawyer for several of the Guantanamo prisoners, and also a lawyer for victims of US drone strikes outside of war zones. So we at Revolution Books are very proud to be hosting the program today. Revolution Books is a bookstore about the world for a radically different world. This is where you come to find the books, the dialogue, the debate about why the world is the way it is the horror that it is, and how it can be transformed through revolution. This is a place, a space that values critical thinking, the poetic spirit, and the unhindered search for the truth. And what fires the spirit of deeply understanding the world and radically transforming it through revolution knowing this world and changing this world as it is and as it could be what fires that spirit is a whole new framework a scientific framework for human emancipation and that is the new communism developed by baba vakian the most important political thinker and leader in the world today so again welcome to revolution books into our program tonight America's torture colony, 19 years of Guantanamo. It must be closed now. Now this issue of Guantanamo has faded from the public discourse, but it is one of the great crimes of this system of US capitalism, imperialism, and anyone with heart, conscience, and conviction must demand that it be closed now. So, with that, I'm going to turn the program over to Andy Worthington as he takes his seat, and we'll hear from him. He's going to give a timeline and background and bring us up to date about what is happening, what has happened at Guantanamo. And after Andy, we'll hear from Shelby. Then there'll be some conversation between the two of them, and I'll join in. I'll say some more about Revolution Books. Uh, and we want to hear from you in the audience. You can send in your comments and questions uh, on the chat line and uh, email in, and uh, we'll try to uh, give you the greatest possibility, opportunity uh, to ask your questions and share your thoughts with our two speakers. So I hand it over to Andy Worthington, and the show begins. Thank you, <clears throat> thank Raymond for the introduction. Um, this is a, obviously a new experience. Um, for the last 10 years, I've been coming over to the US to mark the terrible anniversary of the opening of Guantanamo on January the 11th. Um, and this year, because of COVID, I'm obviously not able to be with you all. Um, and also, of course, this format gives us an opportunity to 
uh, welcome people who can't necessarily make it to your your wonderful store up in Harlem. So we potentially have an international audience, but I'm not sure how many people are here uh, watching and listening tonight. Um, but hello to you all. Um, so on Monday, it was the 19th anniversary of the opening of Guantanamo. The prison uh, is now in its 20th year of operations. Um, on Wednesday, um, Joe Biden will be inaugurated as the fourth president to have control of the prison. Um, and we are looking at a situation where 40 men are still held at Guantanamo. This is um, just a 5% of the total number of people who've been held there over the 19 years. Um, but those men who are still held are still in this um, terrible predicament, um, the same fundamentally <clears throat> as they were when the prison opened, that they have no fundamental rights in the way that you or I understand the rights that we should have if someone were to deprive us of our, our liberty. Um, so, you know, fundamentally in countries that claim to respect the rule of law, countries that claim to be liberal democracies uh, like our countries, if you're going to be deprived of your liberty, you uh, are charged with a crime and you are fairly swiftly put on trial and if convicted, given a prison sentence. Um, or you can be taken off the battlefield during military hostilities and held unmolested until the end of the conflict. Um, the men in Guantanamo have never been in uh, this position. They were um, held as uh, un unlawful enemy combatants by the Bush administration, a, a term that when you investigate it really seems to have been made up. Um, they claimed that they could hold people at Guantanamo without rights, and they um, have certainly uh, done their best to achieve that over the years. It took many years for lawyers who fought from the beginning um, to get any fundamental rights for the prisoners. Um, they eventually secured habeas corpus rights, um, had to go to the Supreme Court twice for those to be fully implemented, which led to a golden period of a couple of years from 2008 to 2010, when judges uh, were able to impartially assess what purported to be the evidence against the prisoners in around three dozen cases, concluded that the government had no case, had failed to establish, even with a very low bar, um, that these men were connected in any meaningful way to Al-Qaeda or the Taliban. Um, that, was, that was George W. Bush. Uh, 530 of the men were released under, under George W. Bush. 532, I believe. Uh, then we had Barack Obama, who came in promising to close Guantanamo within a year and left after eight years without having closed Guantanamo. Now, Barack Obama did eventually release nearly 200 men, but he didn't close it. And the, the, the awful weight of that only really became apparent when the baton of responsibility for Guantanamo wasn't handed on to Hillary Clinton, as he may well have supposed, whom, who would probably have carried on in the way that he had, but went to Donald Trump. Donald Trump, before he was even inaugurated four years ago, tweeted, there must be no more releases from Gitmo. And with one exception, he has been true to his word. The one exception is a Saudi man who had agreed to a plea deal in his military commission proceedings, uh, which stipulated that he would be released from Guantanamo to serve the rest of his sentence in Saudi Arabia. Apart from this man, Donald Trump has released nobody for four years. And so what rights do any of these men have if a president can be installed in the White House who simply says, no one is leaving Guantanamo and no one gets to leave Guantanamo. It seems to me that what four years of Trump have highlighted is that the men held at Guantanamo are the personal prisoners of the president, are executive prisoners, are in many ways political prisoners. This is nothing to do with the law. The law has tried and has largely failed to deal with the fact that this is a broken political project that should never have happened and that has left these 40 men there. So when Joe Biden is inaugurated, he's going to inherit three particular problems. He's going to inherit 
six men who were who have been approved for release. Five of these men were approved uh, by two review processes that were established by President Obama, and they were not released before he left office. The second of these review processes was called the periodic review boards. It was a kind of parole type process uh, with the distinction that normally when you get parole, you've actually had a sentence. Um, these men were able to try and make a case that they um, were contrite about what they were alleged to have done, whether they'd done it or not, and that they would um, take up peaceful lives if released from the prison. And, you know, during during President Obama's presidency, this led to the release of three dozen men. And it was a good way of getting around the fact that Republicans were doing all that they could to block um, him releasing prisoners in any other way. Um, when Donald Trump became the commander in chief, then it became very clear that the man who said there must be no more releases from Gitmo didn't want prisoners being approved for release through the periodic review boards. And no one was approved for release from the periodic review boards. And a couple of years into Trump's presidency, the prisoners, for the most, star, most part, started boycotting the process because they had concluded that what had worked under Obama had become a sham. Um, and then we got the news just, um, just a month ago. Um, the decision was taken at the end of October, but didn't come through publicly until December, that one man, just one man, had been approved for release by this periodic review board. Now, we've got these six men cleared for release. The 20, there are 25 others who are in this category of prisoners who are eligible for these reviews by the periodic review board. This process was set up in 2013. As I say, it led to the release of three dozen men. Um, two of the men who were cleared for release went through the PRBs and were approved for release. But in the cases of these 25 others, they were not approved for release and they are persistently not approved for release when their cases come up for these reviews. And this is for a variety of reasons. Some of them have allegations against them of having been involved in, in some way in terrorist organizations. And yet the United States claims that it can't produce evidence to put these men on trial. Other men are, I believe, cases of mistaken identity. Other men, their role has been exaggerated. And in other cases, um, I would say it's quite clear that the only reason that these men are still detained is because they are regarded as having had a bad attitude since they got to Guantanamo. So this is nothing to do with what they were doing before they got to Guantanamo. Um, this is about how they have responded to being held indefinitely without charge or trial and brutalized in this monstrous prison that the United States set up 19 years ago. There are nine men to complete the picture who are facing or have faced the military commission trial system at Guantanamo, which is a broken system. It's basically the judicial version of, version of Groundhog Day where it just goes round and round and no conclusion can ever be reached because fundamentally the defense teams have to expose the torture to which their clients were subjected if there is to be such a thing as a fair trial, whereas the prosecution, their job is to continue to hide all evidence that these men were tortured in CIA black sites. It's an impasse. I don't know how it can be broken except to find a way of moving people who the US really wants to charge to federal court. But for the rest of the prisoners, we have this problem of, you know, the media for many years has called them forever prisoners because they really are. There is supposedly this periodic review process that, that looks in a meaningful manner at whether they constitute a threat to the US, but it seems to have, it seems to have got stuck. It seems to have repeatedly got stuck on assessing that these people continue to be a threat, even though it's, a, it's very difficult to substantiate quite what that means with this aging population of people who, you know, are trying their very best to say um, to the United States, you know, have we not all had enough of this? 
surely if we're going to look at the cases of these men, if they had done something, they would have served a sentence for it by now. This is nearly 20 years. We're looking next January at the 20th anniversary of the opening of Guantanamo. And people are held because they have a bad attitude, because maybe they constituted some kind of threat 20 years ago. It's really not good enough. And what I hope that Joe Biden does is that he recognizes that he, he has been stuck with the forever prisoners. He has inherited the forever prisoners and that it is no longer acceptable. It never has been. But as we reach this 20th anniversary, as we're on the fourth president to have control of Guantanamo, it is simply unacceptable to continue holding people indefinitely without charge or trial on some nebulous basis of the threat that they pose. If that was to happen to you or I or to any of our other fellow citizens, I'm pretty sure that there would, you know, that there would be outrage about what had been happening to American and British citizens. Um, but because they are this category of the enemy combatants, the worst of the worst, um, then we're supposed to accept that this terrible stain on America's claim that it respects the rule of law um, can stand. And every day that the prison is open, it's actually um, just a disgrace, a moral, ethical disgrace and legal disgrace. So... Um, I will eventually let Shelby talk, <laughs> but um, in practical terms, you know, we need to all be thinking about and working together about the best ways of approaching the Biden administration. I know that various NGOs and lawyers organizations are already trying to talk to them. There has been some good stuff written. Really, Joe Biden needs to appoint somebody within his administration to take charge of Guantanamo. There was nobody under Donald Trump. There was so nobody under Donald Trump that when a couple of Libyan guys who'd been sent to Senegal were sent back to Libya, um, where, they, where, they were, where they disappeared essentially, where they were imprisoned in horrible conditions by Libyan militias, there was nobody in the Trump administration that anybody could talk to about addressing this because Trump had shut the door on the office of the envoy for Guantanamo closure which existed under President Obama. And Biden either needs to revive this or he needs to appoint somebody uh, within the White House to deal with Guantanamo's closure so that there is a focal point and a person whose job it is on a daily basis to actually deal with the horror of this hellhole and finally get it closed. Um, so that's it from me for now. I'm going to hand you over to Shelby, who I'm very glad to see here and who I also hope will bring us some stories um, from inside Guantanamo and of her clients. Thank you, Andy and everyone. Um, I'm really happy and honored to be here. I think it's really important what we're doing today. And I think that uh, Guantanamo anniversary events generally are quite important because it reminds America, and I am sure that everyone listening knows someone um, or like gulp multiple people who don't know that Guantanamo is not closed or that people are indeed still there um, and they are not actually the masterminds of 9-11 as I've heard presented to me. Um, so what I do generally um, is represent Guantanamo Bay detainees uh, among others accused of terrorist crimes. Um, and I represent about eight men. Uh, I serve as legal counsel to approximately 15. Um, and that, and I say approximately, and it sounds silly because no person is less than a single person. So why can't I count it? And the answer is because there is actually a dearth of legal counsel for the men who remain there. And there are like, um, scarce few of us who are able and willing to do so. Um, and there, are, so of the 40 men who remain, um, 26 of them are low value detainees and the other nine, as Andy mentioned, um, well, the other 17 
are high value, uh, nine of whom are in commissions proceedings. Um, I will not bore you with my personal trajectory as to like how I wound up in this very kind of like unique position in my life, in my legal career. Um, I didn't go to law school because I believed in the efficacy of, of American law or like the justice system, quote unquote, um, which I have said openly since the day I was born. Um, it's because I don't believe in it. And I think that it's my responsibility to stand for it. Um, and I happened to encounter a situation where in my immigration clinic, uh, there existed a Guantanamo program in New York City, uh, of course, under Ramsey Kostam at CUNY Law. Um, and th that kind of further opened my eyes to what I already knew was a problem, um, but didn't remotely comprehend the caliber of a problem that it was. And when I first got the assignment to work for people who are in Guantanamo, who are surviving Guantanamo, I, I reject the word living in. Um, I thought to myself, oh, well, isn't that closing? You know, I graduated in 2015. Um, and thus we were still under Obama's reign. And I drank the Kool-Aid I didn't realize I had drunk. Um, and I've been there ever since and I refuse to let go. I've changed positions um, in terms of employment a few times now. Uh, but the reality is that my relationship with my clients is, is a very unique one. It's a very personal one. Um, there are scarce few of them who remain and those who do, I know quite well. And to be honest, um, <laughs> well, to be honest, multiple things, uh, Stage one, I am always grateful for Andy to give the overview of what's happened because I would digress in a very tedious way. So I'm, <laughs> I'm happy that not only does he frankly know the history better than I do, um, just because he's lived it as an advocate in a very real way, um, but also, um, it's the fact that this is such an emotional topic for me, which I realize, like, as a lawyer, you're probably not supposed to be emotional, but because my job has been for several years to represent men who think they're going to die in prison, but don't quite know, um, which, if anyone's curious, is actually torture. It's been, like, um, affirmed by multiple sources and you know, um, folks who define such things as being a form of torture to not know your own destination um, as being so. And I engage with with folks who, I don't want to overpaint the photo, but regularly consider taking their lives because they're not quite sure what their lives will be or or if they matter at all. Um, their contact to the outside world is limited, by which I mean so thoroughly limited that no one knows, um, no one knows that they're still there. Uh, none of my clients, no man who's ever been to, no man who's ever been to and 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 continues to exist in Guantanamo, has um, seen in person their relatives for the duration of their detention, which means nineteen to 10 years because there was basically like an influx of detainees um, 19 years ago. And then there was another influx about 10 years ago. And I say detainees in quotes, not just because I love uh, air quotes, but also because, you know, the U S government has chosen phrases very purposefully um, as it continues to do and will continue to do for its existence. Um, as a lawyer, I will pedantically, sorry, say that to be detained means to be temporarily stopped. Like, you know, like if you're at a, a checkpoint, like you're just driving around and all of a sudden there's a, a cop on the side of the road and they're doing like a sobriety checkpoint, whatever that is. 
um, technically you're detained for that very temporary period and then you're released. Um, if y'all are from New York City or any major metropolitan area, you will probably be familiar with the fact that um, NYPD and others will stop you temporarily as you enter, you know, the metro system um, to search your bag or just to say like, oh, hi, please give me your identification, whatever that is. That is a temporary, quote, detention. Um, and what is really messed up um, in a way that honestly I, nor I think any others know is, is purposeful or not, is that they, they've termed these people detainees, those who are detained, right? Um, and there's been a lot of pushback from folks who are in this community to identify them as prisoners because they're not detained. Hmm. To be detained is to be temporarily held. And it also has legal ramifications. Um, where one needn't, uh, you know, prove why you're detained. You're just detained because you're a person on the road trying to go from point A to point B, and then there's a sobriety checkpoint. Um, the government doesn't have to actually prove itself. And that is, with technical legal exceptions, that is actually what's kind of happened here. Um, the men there have pretty much just been rounded up um, and the U.S. and Pakistan, as like the Pakistani president has made quite clear in his autobiography, um, a lot of the people who are present um, were turned in via bounties, uh, which is not to say that I'm trying to represent that the 40 men who remain there are complete random human beings who you know, were turned in just because of the greed of their um, neighbors. But the reality is that is in very many cases the, the truth. And um, the U.S. has very quietly affirmed that reality over the years. And what's tremendously sad is that during the Trump administration, um, those prisoners who feel or know that that is their reality have met a certain level of futility um, that I can't understand. Um, the only thing I can understand is trying to convince someone to have hope when I can't give it to them. Um, and I'm going to stop myself from saying a bunch more because this is my entire identity and what I do. And thus I could bore you to tears um but i'm happy to answer questions and i'm sure andy is as well um i'm andy uh, this is raymond um you can hear me i think you're on i think you're on mute andy I was waiting until you finished your question, but here yeah, I am. No, no. Okay, great. No, just so that we know. Um, well, one, I, I want to thank both of you for the opening remarks. Um, I'd like to sort of pull the lens back. And given the fact that it's almost 20 years and some of the people watching this were not even born when, you know, when Guantanamo was opened. Um, you know, Andy, I'm wondering if you could give a little more background uh, on the actual circumstances that led to the creation of this torture colony, you know, the 911 attacks, um, how the US, you know, imperialists responded to that, how they saw, you know, Guantanamo, and in particular, you know, who these people were, where they were rounded up, and then what are the core elements of Guantanamo is new definitions of you know, who a prisoner is, what a combatant is, um, what torture is. Um, you know, this is a period of, you know, what was called and still is called enhanced interrogation techniques. So I, I think it would be helpful for our audience in terms of just some of the basics and the background and the horrible, horrific history of this, you know, torture site. But, you know, some of the, what was, go, you know, what was, you know, 
quote unquote, motivating the creation of Guantanamo, what function it served, um, and how you know the legal system, the U.S. you know went into action to redefine some things and to create some precedents that are still on the books and extremely dangerous. So maybe you could walk us back to two, you know, two thousand, you know, sort of nine one one you know, the, the quote unquote war on terror, which is actually a war for greater empire. But how did Guantanamo fit in? And especially, you know, who were the people that were rounded up, quote unquote, by whom? And what about these new categories of prisoners? I mean, both of you were speaking to that, but I think it would be good just to bring it into very sharp focus, especially for people watching who don't know that, uh, you know, that that history. So. If you could do that in a very capsulated way, that I think would be helpful. Okay, Raymond, yeah. Well, um, yeah, so I mean, I began researching the, the prison in 2005 and in 2006, in the spring of 2006, that was when the Pentagon lost a lawsuit um, and had to finally provide the names and nationalities of the men it was holding. It hadn't done that for the first four years of the prison's existence. And something like 8,000 pages of documentation that was um, the unclassified allegation, summaries of evidence against the prisoners and transcripts of the administrative hearings that had taken place at Guantanamo to assess whether or not these men were enemy combatants who could continue to be detained without having any fundamental rights um, all of this was a, you know, a broken process, but the information was, um, was hugely interesting um, to analyze, uh, which was what I then proceeded to do. And I spent a period of about 14 months um, going through these documents and working out who was who. Um, so, you know, all the, all the supporting documentation, the transcripts would have prisoner numbers on uh, but not names. I mean, they, they don't have names. Prisoners in Guantanamo don't have names. They're numbers. But I would cross-reference the numbers to the list that the Pentagon had made available of who was actually in Guantanamo so that I could then come up with um, an assessment of who was actually there. Um, and, you know, famously, the United States government claimed that um, everyone there was the worst of the worst who was seized on the battlefield. And actually, no one seems to have been seized on any battlefield. So um, what I found was that um, a certain number of these prisoners were captured in various circumstances in Afghanistan. Um, the largest group of prisoners were captured crossing from Afghanistan into Pakistan um, in December 2001. Um, so this was after a kind of showdown between um, Al-Qaeda and Afghan fighters and um, and the United States, which was using Afghan fighters on the ground. Um, and, you know, and all of those people were regarded by the United States as people who had fled from this confrontation in Tora Bora, regardless of, you know, whether that was true or not, because actually the situation in Afghanistan was so horrific that all kinds of people who had ended up in Afghanistan were trying to get to Pakistan, um, fleeing the destruction in Afghanistan. So, you know, there were civilians there as well as missionaries who'd been, uh, <coughs> people from other countries who'd gone to Afghanistan as missionaries. Um, of course, there were soldiers as well, the, you know, people who had been told to go to um, Afghanistan to support the Taliban, to create this pure Islamic state. Um, and then suddenly 9-11 happened and then suddenly everyone became a terrorist. And one of the great ironies of Guantanamo really is that soldiers have been treated as terrorists, whereas the, the handful of people at Guantanamo who are allegedly involved in any kind of terrorism haven't been charged with terrorism as a crime. So they're actually put in this strange position where they can kind of claim that they're warriors, if you like. So all the categories of everything have become very muddled. Um, and fundamentally, at the heart of it all, is that still, to my mind, shocking reality that the United States set up a prison on the U.S. naval base that it had on Guantanamo, which it had taken during the 
um, during the war in, in Cuba over a hundred years ago and now paid a lease on it for a small amount than, and the lease can't be broken unless both sides agree. And that they had deliberately put a prison there because they presumed it would be beyond the reach of the courts. Um, so that the men held would have no rights and that the United States could do whatever it wanted to them. And when you, you know, look at that kind of position and ask yourself, what, what is it that they would want to do? Then you realize that what it is they would want to do is to subject these people to torture and other forms of abuse without having anybody tell them that that's not what they're allowed to do. Um, so, you know, you've got the group of people from Afghanistan, the larger group of people crossing from Afghanistan into Pakistan. Um, then you also have um, many dozens of people who were captured mainly in the first half of 2002 in house raids in Pakistan, um, which, you know, seem to have been based on very dubious intelligence for the most part and tie into that reference that Shelby made to President Musharraf's autobiography, where he claimed in 2006 that Pakistan had received hundreds of million do millions of dollars in exchange for handing over terror suspects. Um, but some really shocking stories. I mean, literally, you know, one man answered the door um, and the person that, the, that they were looking for wasn't there, so they took him instead. I mean, this is literally a case, um, <laughs> you know, um, I can't even begin to, to you know, um, to, to go through the cases of mistaken identity that happened in these Pakistani raids. And then the last group of people in Guantanamo, a group of about 40 prisoners, if I recall correctly, were people who were seized in other places and who had gone through the black site system, um, you know, which we finally know from the Senate torture report that, that where we got the executive summary in 2014, that there were 119 people um, in, in this system. Um, actually, the Senate report didn't cover um, people who were held in proxy prisons on behalf of the CIA in other countries. And also, you know, their bookkeeping was so poor that, um, you know, who knows how many people they didn't even have records for. But um, the official figures that we have are 119 people who were uh, at some point imprisoned in the network of black sites, torture prisons, that the CIA set up in other people's countries because the United States isn't allowed to set up open torture prisons in, uh, in, in, on the US mainland. Um, and 40 of these had also ended up at Guantanamo. So those are the people who were there. And, you know, the, the, the releases from Guantanamo, first of all, came about because prisoners' home governments um, at some point um, faced some kind of pressure from their populations or from, from you know, from, from the media, from NGOs, eventually, um, about, about what was happening uh, to their citizens. So, you know, European countries got their prisoners back in 2004 and 2005. Uh, you know, the Saudis eventually um, got fed up with uh, their men being held and, and a large number of Saudi prisoners were sent back uh, in George W. Bush's second term towards the end of his presidency. You know, and then, um, and then it, got, it got harder. The prisoners won this significant legal victory in 2004 when the Supreme Court ruled that they um, had habeas corpus rights, in other words, to ask an impartial judge why they were being held. Um, those rights were then taken away by Congress under George W. Bush, and it took another four years for them to be reinstated. But what it did lead to in 2004 was attorneys like Shelby. I mean, Shelby wasn't there at the beginning, but attorneys to be able to go to Guantanamo and for the first time to be the first people, apart from Red Cross representatives, outside of the US government, outside of the US establishment, to meet prisoners, to hear their stories, and to start to find ways to bring those stories to the outside world. Um, and, you know, as I, as I mentioned in, you know, at, at, at the beginning when I was speaking, eventually when the, when the prisoners 
secured constitutionally guaranteed habeas corpus rights in 2008 from the Supreme Court. That led to um, a couple of years of habeas corpus cases that went in their favor, um, where, you know, in around three dozen cases, the judges said, you know, you, the, to the government, you have not, we have set you a very low evidentiary hurdle here, but you have not even met it in establishing that these people were involved in any meaningful sense with Al-Qaeda or the Taliban and ordered their release. And what happened then was that um, politically motivated judges in the appeals court in Washington, D.C. pushed back and started rewriting the rules. Um, eventually, you know, they started chipping away at all of the bases of assessing what purported to be the government's evidence and eventually um, said that there had to be the presumption of accuracy um, in what was put forward by the government. Um, now that's laughable um, when you spend any time looking at what purports to be evidence on the part of the, the government. Um, but for prisoners in Guantanamo, how are they supposed to marshal any sort of case against what the government is claiming when they're stuck in Guantanamo with no facilities, with no ability to do anything meaningful to challenge, challenge the basis of their detention? Um, and so, you know, the pushback from these judges was so successful that this period of two years when the law actually applied at Guantanamo ended. It ended in the summer of 2010. The final nail in its coffin came in 2011 um, when, uh, when all of these rulings, you know, reached this point where it was clearly impossible for any prisoner to have their habeas corpus petition granted and the law died at Guantanamo again um and this was you know this was um during the time of president obama we we basically saw the law die again at guantanamo and um and so this process of prisoners being released because of um a political situation was something that then took over. And actually what happened under President Obama was that he faced a, um, he faced um, absolutely unprincipled opposition on Guantanamo from the Republicans who set up as many barriers as they could to him releasing prisoners. Um, so that, you know, that was why he ended up coming up with a parole type process, that one that um, would, would change, the, would shift the goalposts in terms of how prisoners were assessed so that some of them could be released um, but he refused to what i believe was possible he refused to spend the political capital necessary to finally qu close guantanamo um, because you know he his advisors the administration um, didn't think it was worth it they didn't think that the amount of flat they were going to get from the republicans was worth finishing the job and actually closing Guantanamo for good. So now that you know, that's why we're in this position where um, the law still doesn't apply. Um, every effort to challenge the imprisonment of these men on a legal basis has not um, been taken up um, sufficiently. You know, the Supreme Court has refused to engage with it since um, 2008. Um, and of course, you know, the, 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 the legacy of Donald Trump is to have left a Supreme Court that is much more right wing than the one that, um, that, that provided habeas corpus rights to the prisoners in 2004 and 2008. Um, so this is the situation that we all need to be aware of when we're looking at, um, at Joe Biden. And I think, I think what, you know, was very moving as it was last year when Shelby was talking about her prisoners, is to bring this perspective from inside the prison of the hopelessness that is felt by men who are possibly, but not categorically, detained forever without ever having been charged or tried or convicted or anything. Um, but that, that um, uncertainty of whether it is forever, um, because if it was forever, you would at least be able to possibly, possibly get your head around dealing with that. But not knowing is worse. 
And actually, you know, it always reminds me of a comment that was made by a man called Christophe Giro, who worked for the International Committee of the Red Cross. And the International Committee of the Red Cross gets access to prisoners who are held in any kind of prisons that are on the edges of legality or on the edges of what is acceptable. And they had access to Guantanamo. And what they are supposed to do in exchange for this is that they don't comment critically about what's happening. But they were so appalled by Guantanamo that they actually did regularly speak publicly about it. And it was partly their interventions that helped to highlight what was going on and that helped to eventually you know lead to to slight changes that were better for the prisoners um but in october 2003 so the prison hadn't even been opened for, for two years at this point christophe giro was asked you know what he was particularly troubled about at Guantanamo, and he said what concerns us is the open-ended detention of these prisoners and the effects on their mental health so that is what they are still facing, open-ended detention. And the effects of that are a form of torture, as Shelby said. And I think that it's very important for us to recognize that um, when it comes to torture at Guantanamo, those of us who've paid attention to the story over the years will know that from 2002 until 2004, when the lawyers first got into Guantanamo and pierced the veil of secrecy, there were all kinds of torture going on at Guantanamo. Um, there were different groups of interrogators, some of whom were trying to build cases that would be lawful, and others who were basically told, given an Abu Ghraib scenario, you know, go in there, you know, mess with these people, um, really really badly mess with them, keep them awake, play them loud music all night, you know, strip them naked, threaten them with dogs, all of this. All of this was happening. And yet, Guantanamo has always been a place of torture because holding people indefinitely without charge or trial, with no notion of when, if ever, they may be released, and with no human contact at all, during any of the of this imprisonment, that even if one of even if their family members could somehow get to the naval base at Guantanamo, had the money to charter a plane to get there, they would not be allowed to see their loved ones. They would not be allowed to sit in a room with them. They would not be allowed to touch them. So Guantanamo remains this place of torture, and Joe Biden needs to close it. And what I'm hoping that we can you know, get out to the public this year. And I'm hoping that Shelby will really want to work with me on this because um, it's getting the stories of the men who are held out there um, because there are some, so there are some terrible stories that should shame all sentient, responsible Americans and other people around the world. But this is America's prison. Um, which that are just a source of shame of these people who are who do not constitute a threat to the United States. They are either people, as I said earlier, they are either there are cases of mistaken identity, there are cases of people with a bad attitude, there are cases of persistent over overreaction to um, the threat level posed by prisoners. It's there all along. If you were seized by mistake, they didn't want to admit it. When they were first administratively reviewing the prisoners' cases in the summer of 2004, they had a category that lasted for maybe a couple of weeks. It was not enemy combatants. It, it only lasted until lawyers looked at it and said, not enemy combatants means that we're liable for mistakes that we made. So they changed it to no longer enemy combatants. There has always been this, the basis of Guantanamo is that everybody was guilty and that however much it is exposed that this is the biggest screaming lie in modern American history, they still managed to keep the lid on it. It really is, it really is an abominable betrayal of the truth, justice, and the law 
on the most colossal scale. Um, it remains that and it will be every day until it's finally shut. Um, Andy, um, thank you for giving more of that background and that very powerful moral and legal and political indictment of what Guantanamo represents. We've gotten a few questions too that I'd like to direct at um, Shelby. Um, and um, here uh, from Michael Rapkin, he says, hello, Shelby. Uh, you helped me obtain uh, Mohammed uh, Ghanem's uh, transfer from Guantanamo to the Saudi Rehab Center in January 2017, just days before Obama left office. Do you know how many people are on hunger strike in Guantanamo? And in answering that, uh, maybe you could give the background of, you know, what prompted these hunger strikes, what, how, how those prisoners have been treated. Uh, so there's a question here about how many people are on hunger strike now, and mm -hmm. as I said, some background. And then someone else uh, has asked you, Shelby, uh, as someone who has visited the prison, uh, can you speak to the coronavirus threat to the prisoners there? And uh, also maybe you could uh, let people know that there's Guantanamo and then there's Camp X-Ray, right? There's uh, a quote unquote, what they say, the rule is the worst of the worst. And then there's the worst of the worst of the worst, creating again, you know, new categories, you know, for torture and denial of rights. So the two questions were uh, about the hunger strike and the current uh, coronavirus and the threat that that poses. Sure. Um, I'm very happy to hear from Michael. Uh, I, and I'm also very ha happy to have like been kind of conveniently placed to do a very small thing to assist his client who he had helped for so many years. Um, hunger strike. Honestly, like the topic is so storied, which is a pretentious word probably, but um, when I first started working with Guantanamo Bay detainees, which is not the direct answer that lawyers give, but moving on. Uh, when I first started working there, um, I knew, so my client, my very first client was Shakur Amr, um, who Andy knows quite well. And he was kind of the quintessential hunger striker. Um, and it is the lone manner by which people in, uh, well, in prison, but in other circumstances as well that are like dire um, can effectuate their own agency or power. Um, they can't, you know, protest with signs outside of whatever organization. Um, they can't determine when they eat or drink or do anything else for that matter. They cannot determine when they speak to their own family or by what means, and they cannot keep that communication private ever, ever, ever. Um, the mode by which detainees communicate with family um, is at its very best, um, at its absolute best, it's a visual, verbal communication. It's basically what we're doing right now. It, it, it's, um, it's a Zoom conversation, otherwise known as Skype presume uh, with their family and it's monitored by at a very minimum of two security agencies which is to say the U.S. and whatever country in which the detainee's uh, family happens to reside. Um, the privilege team is there as well. Um, there are ICRC representatives, um, International Red Cross, um, I'm certain that their presence is uh, received quite differently than the governmental presence. Um, but all that to say, um, that communication um, aside, the very first circumstance that I had encountered um, was not only understanding that Shacker was um, 
he was trying to undertake the last right that he had left, um, which is his own his own theoretical right to feed himself, um, which is a tremendously sad thing. And, and it's also very difficult, I think, to be honest, for a lot of Westerners or perhaps humans like writ large. Um, I like to blame Americans for a lot of things as an American who <laughs> um, understands what that is. But the reality is that it's, it's a very difficult concept to undertake that a person would purposely forego food and no, they do not want to die. Um, that's not their purpose. What they're trying to do is to exert the only right that they've got left. Um, some of some of them, to be fair, uh, some of them do, some of them and many of them are at least willing to engage with the reality that they may be harming themselves by doing so, right? Yeah, you don't engage in self-harm without being cognizant of it. And these men are no different from everyone else. Um, they're aware of the fact that they could harm themselves by doing so. And for years, um, hunger striking in Guantanamo has been used as a mechanism for change. And I know that sounds confusing and odd to all of us, but the reality is if at its largest point, right, with, you know, 700, 800-ish uh, detainees in Guantanamo Bay, um, even if you take that down several hundred, you've got several hundred men who are refusing to eat and voluntarily taking on the concept of death you've got the administration's attention. You got them, you know? They are either going to have to mitigate that threat by force feeding you, which is to have their attention directed toward that, or they're going to have to send your bodies out in bags and engage with whatever political repercussions from your countries of origin or the United States or whatever political machinations exists above that read the US that exists. Um, and it was used to great effect for several years by very intelligent men. Um, and honestly, it is one of my greatest um, frustrations, to be honest, uh, to try to explain to people that the folks who have engaged in hunger striking, whether they be in California prisons um, or those in Guantanamo, though those in Guantanamo are obviously my focus and probably the international focus, um, they're not trying to kill themselves slowly. They're, they've not given up and they've certainly not given up due to some sort of de facto like um, moral judgment upon themselves. They're trying to exert their power, the only power they've got left. And I know it sounds crazy to consider the fact that a human being could have no other power than the than the power that it is to feed oneself. It sounds weird, but if you really think about it, that's the way that it works. So all of the, you know, cells in Guantanamo have toilets in them, or they've at least got, a, at its worst, uh, a hole in the ground near the wall in which one is supposed to, you know, one is supposed to like consider that a toilet. Um, there has been history of, of a lack of water being given to detainees that I won't go into, um, most of which is classified because all shames are classified, despite the fact that that's illegal. Um, a lot of my information has come directly from the men and uh, thus I, I, I can't share unless it's been declassified, which is a really great way that, um, that governments and our government specifically has kind of um, covered its own shame. But um, all that to say, there were particular leaders uh, in Guantanamo for years and kind of logically they were the English speakers. So you've got Shakar Amr um, and, and several others who I, won't bore you to name, but um, 
those who had English skills were, were kind of deemed leaders and for the most part were also, uh, so I think that circumstantially a bit more educated, but also um, willing to do so specifically Shacker. So you've got, you're in a position of leadership and you can communicate with the guard force because the guard force, um, you know, if you create a prison for folks who, for the most part, speak Arabic, Urdu, Farsi, um, you'd be shocked at the lack of communication skills that the guard force and those employed have had over the years and continue to have. Um, so it was English communication that was of the utmost importance. Um, and uh, so you've got all those people and you have a few who can speak English, um, who can communicate. And when they were being completely mistreated in ways that I can only generally go into, um, but Andy has touched on several of them um, with regard to blasting music, heat, cold, you know, you imagine um, a 57 year old man who has arthritis and isn't in the best shape and you take away everything that he has, including whatever mat he might have. Um, and then you blast air conditioning into his room. And of course we don't have temperature monitors on this post facto analysis, but um, you know, you're freezing uh, for several days and you know, I feel like to this audience, at least I don't really need to justify the the idea of a protest, but oddly I'm conditioned to feel as though I do need to justify it. Um, you're given whatever non-existent food source you are, you're, they refuse to tell you what time it is and thus you cannot pray at the correct times. They refuse to tell you what direction is north and thus you can't pray in the correct direction. Uh, you're not given your manuscript that is holy to you um, and 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 also you're being held without charge or trial just an aside so folks engage in protest and that is the one way that they can do that um, because they're all kept separately and in particular over the years they are in solitary on lockdown um, and that's their one mode of communication to the administration or the powers that be. Um, it's somewhat trivial, but interesting, at least to me, that um, they, my clients will often refer to the powers that be as the quote commander. Um, and I happen to know that the, the JDG commander, which is Joint Detention Group, commander, which is otherwise known in general terms as a warden of a prison, um, is a colonel. Uh, and it very sadly took me quite a while to understand exactly who they were referring to. The only way to communicate with that guy is to either try to kill yourself in a very visceral, dangerous way, or to engage in a hunger strike. And I've given probably too in-depth of a background, but um, the very second year that I was working on these cases, I watched uh, a force feeding, and I frankly only know of one videotaped legally acquired by counsel force feeding, and it was of um, Diab, um, Ahmed Diab, and he is now well, he was resettled to Uruguay in 2014, thankfully. Um, and he was one of the, the kind of leaders. Um, and I think those leaders kept to their positions of protest in a way that others didn't feel like they really necessarily had to. So there's a reason that Shakar Amr and Diab um, were the more severe protesters. Um, they were the leaders and, and they kind of had to continue to hold fast. Um, I can't actually talk about what I saw, which is absurd as it is. Um, but it was horrific 
and I didn't sleep for a long time. So I, I, I feel like I can at least share that much. Um, and in answer to the actual question, sorry, Michael, <laughs> um, in answer to your actual question, none of them are on hunger strike. And there's, there's a very alarming reason for that. Um, it's because they stopped feeding men on hunger strike. And that was about two years ago. Um, there was also litigation in the name of uh, Ahmed Rabani, who was my client at the time. Um, so what had been historically the case and subject of litigation for several years, probably between, it was, it was the actual practice for about 10 years, um, culminating in, I would say 2016 or 17, uh, that folks would be force fed by tubes that were about a half an inch in diameter, um, pointed. The truth is I don't even want to go into how gruesome it was, but like their entire nasal cavities were ripped up as these two tubes would go into their throats, into their bellies. Um, and so many of them would be overfed. I would like to say purposely, but it's really hard to, it's really hard to prove purpose as a lawyer. I can't actually say it was purposefully done. I don't know that. But the reality is when you're inserting uh, Ensure, right? We all know what Ensure or like other protein type drinks are. When you're inserting that into an individual and they start vomiting because they've reached capacity in their stomachs, or at least that's the assumption for, you know, um, for most, one would theoretically stop. Um, and it didn't stop. Uh, so they were force fed in a very brutal way. Oftentimes, more often than I've ever heard of, actually, more often than not, um, a particular navel cavity was, ended up being uh, inflamed and thus closed, such that only one tube could go down one nostril. Um, which is the only proof that we have, which sounds crazy, but it's the only proof that we have that they were ab abusing people such that like, if you were going to force feed folks in theory to insert, to intubate a person uh, in hospital, right? Um, my father had that done recently and so many people that I know and love. Um, that's not the result uh, to intubate a person is not comfortable, but it certainly doesn't close up a nostril or like a, you know, in any case, abuse was done. And I, sorry, I launched into this, like I have to prove it mantra, but the reality is that that's what we've got to do all the time. Um, and the other sad reality is that when there were large numbers of men in Guantanamo, they were at least mildly able to affect change by banding together in this way, they weren't given access to one another, but through various means of communication, they were able to at least engage in the same behavior that would inconvenience their captors. And that result was that the administration would engage in dialogue. And when the administration engaged in dialogue, mild amounts of change did happen. Maybe you can have two glasses of water today. Whatever, you know, I, I, I'm being slightly hyperbolic, but not in, in particular circumstances. Um, and, and the reality is that a few years ago, um, Ahmed Rabani and a few others were engaging in hunger striking um, for obvious reasons. And, um, they weren't force fed and it becomes this weird um kind of an oxymoron or a conundrum of, of kind of efforts where um you know we fought force feeding in the courts um i technically represented diab for a few years um around 2015-16 while he was still detained and we fought that as torture and so many others did. 
a bunch of counsel for um, for many detainees, and we meant that litigation. It wasn't frivolous. It was like a, a real plea that they stopped doing what they're doing. Um, but at the same time, these men were used to, and in the latter years, and I would like to say the Obama years, but I don't mean to uh, falsely put the placard of Obama years are totally cool and without torture. <laughs> I would never say that. Um, I would have to give out my legal license for like lying on, on record or something for saying that. But I will say that the techniques differed over the years and a lot of men became accustomed to hunger striking and receiving some measure of nutritional support as a result and they were doing it in that circumstance instead of the original that I've explained as being um, in effort to alert the administration as to a need to discuss a particular issue. Um, the, the detainees who continued to hunger strike and not eat actual food regularly, they meant to do so as a long-term protest to their detention. And there are at least a dozen of them in the Obama administration who intended to do so. Obama got into office with 242 detainees remaining in Gitmo. Um, so you can imagine how many of those men may have tried to continue their hunger strikes just because they're trying to protest their detention. It's the only mechanism by which they can do that. Um, and the methods of delivery were slightly better such that they were just enduring the suffering. They feel like their existence is suffering. You know, uh, you hear probably <laughs> um, frequently about prisoners trying to end their own lives. Imagine prisoners who don't know when their lives will end. Um, taking their lives into their own hands in this manner is not unique. It's not specific to them. Uh, and in the Trump administration, uh, whomever was in control, I frankly, even though like I was personally litigating and I don't quite know who made that decision, um, the medical decision. Uh, so there's what we refer to as a SMO, a senior medical officer. And there's a SMO every probably nine months, six to nine months. There's a new senior medical officer who gives the, you know, kind of mandates down. Um, and over the years, those mandates traditionally come from up on high. Um, and the reality is that they suddenly stopped, stopped the feeding processes. Um, and then we found ourselves in, in what was kind of necessarily a state of hypocrisy where we're expecting the force feedings. Um, our clients have undergone them for 10 change years. Um, and, and they're expecting to at least receive sustenance such that they're not actually, um, you know, depriving their bodies of necessary nutrients such that they're allowing their bodies to, they're not actually trying to kill themselves, which I say in the beginning and I will say at the end, they're not actually trying to kill themselves. So when you, when one, you know, halts the... Um, distribution of any kind of nutrient activity for the hunger strikers, they're now scared they're going to die. Um, so what we did at the time was to speak to the judge, the only person who will ever hear us in these particular cases, um, and, and try to plead with them, uh, with, you know, in opposition to the U.S. government, and say, either you know, either go, go along with your own rules, which has, their, their particular rules have very particular guidelines. If you meet a certain quotient of, of weight deprivation, right, you're at, you know, you've lost 20% of your body weight, whatever it is. Um, the U.S. government has a legal responsibility, according to themselves, but not law, <laughs> to remedy that. Um, so they've got their own guidelines and there are iterations of it every single year. 
Um, and all those iterations are secret. And we have uh, maybe two or three years of them. I've made a personal habit of keeping records of what their internal medical guidelines are to the extent that I have the luck uh, to get a hold of them. And that's generally what it is. Um, if you've missed nine meals, then you go on the, you, you are then labeled a hunger striker and you should be subject to force feeding. And what the Trump administration did was to basically rip up those rules, as far as I understand, because no one has ever proven me wrong. What I understand, practically speaking, to have happened is that the Trump administration completely ripped up all of those rules and just decided not to feed them at all and wait for them to die. And I have encountered so many times the oppositional argument that they should die. If they're going to try to kill themselves, just let them do it. Um, and of course, there's an agency argument there that I respect of all people, but the reality is that's not their intention. They're not trying to die, um, the hunger strikers. There are easier and more uh, efficient and quick ways to kill oneself in the universe than slowly starving to death over the course of 40 to 50 days. Um, they know that they will go into organ failure. Why do they know this? Because all of their lawyers and whatever doctors they're able to see will tell them exactly that. They are scholars on the concept of hunger striking and starving to death. Um, and under Trump, I think it was probably year two of his reign, um, I saw all of my hunger striking clients stop hunger striking because they were concerned that they would go into organ failure and that the administration, which is what they call kind of like the warden generally, the administration uh, would let them die. And as much as like the lawyers tried to convince clients that the US government is too proud to let you die because then it will have to be held accountable. They will keep you alive. They didn't believe that. And at the same time, what we couldn't assure them is that the US government gives a single anything about your health and well being. So the very valid argument that came in response was um, if we hunger strike, we could cause severe permanent organ damage to ourselves. And that won't be remedied. If they will try to general resuscitate us that's one thing causing permanent organ damage that almost necessarily leads to death is another thing um so the reality is i know that there are at least two men who are trying to maintain a hunger strike but under the traditional you know definition of a hunger strike and what we've known it to be from these from specifically this community um, it doesn't exist anymore because they don't they they just expect to shrivel and die uh, under the US government's watch uh, Shelby um, there were uh, both Shelby and um, Andy we had some other questions that I wanted to share with you but you know again, people in the audience, you know, hearing this, um, you know, as Andy said, this is uh, America's prison. And this is um, a crime against humanity. And, you know, I just, you know, want to underscore that, you know, we cannot allow, you know, the system to be perpetuating this. And this is a product of a system, you know, this capitalist imperialist system, this empire, America's empire that erected this prison and these black sites, you know, these secret compounds, you know, around the world where people were, you know, detained and tortured and then sent to Guantanamo. This was all in the context of, you know, America's launching these wars, you know, in Afghanistan and then Iraq and then extending to Syria. Right. And these wars are still going on in different kinds of ways, you know, and, and the assaults and the attacks, you know, Trump, you know, dropped that monster bomb, you know, in Syria. And, um, you know, we have this new administration coming in and it's entirely correct 
that we have to be, you know, raising the demand for this to be closed and these prisoners, you know, to be released, to be repatriated. Um, you know, this is a just and urgent demand. And we also have to recognize that through the administrations, you know, and, uh, you know, from Bush through, through, through Obama, through Trump, you know, what's happening is not just the existence of this prison in all the grisly, you know, horrific detail that we've heard from our two speakers, but that, you know, the rulers of this country are trying to create a new normal in which this is part of the system of jurisprudence, different categories of people, different rules of, you know, torture, and they, this system, these rulers are trying to habituate people, to train people to accept this as a normal, the new normal. And, uh, you know, close your eyes and I don't want to hear about it, but we are going to demand, you know, that people hear about it. There is a moral imperative that people reckon with what is being done in their name. Andy is right. This is America's prison. It is happening you know, under the watch of these administrations. So I just, you know, I'm listening to this and my blood is boiling as someone who studies and writes on this, but to hear these stories and these accounts and what people are going through. Um, I want to uh, let the listening audience, viewing audience know that uh, if they are not able to send questions or comments in through the chat, they can do it through, um, uh, email, send an email to revbooksnyc at yahoo.com. That's rev, R-E-V, V as in Victor, revbooksnyc at yahoo.com. Um, we do have a few other questions. I want to, you know, share them uh, with our speakers. Um, and also, um, uh, Shelby, uh, one of those questions that you weren't able, didn't answer in that round concerned Corona. <laughs> you know, the, the COVID crisis, you know, the, and, and maybe Andy wants to speak to that. Ah. Let me just, but let me just um, let people know there are two questions that have come up. Um, someone says, uh, we recently watched an event about Guantanamo where a British attorney spoke about one of his clients, might have been from Yemen, who is still in prison there. He was accused of being another person, which he consistently denied. Later, that other person was captured correctly and identified and later released, but this client is still in prison. So, you know, maybe there's some um, similar, if not that exact uh, account, and perhaps it's not uh, wholly accurate, not through intention of the writer, but, you know, people are trying to collect their understanding of this. So that was one question uh, as an example of what's going on. And if there are other uh, similar such accounts or that one, uh, and then uh, someone asked, and I believe this was, uh, you know, maybe a follow-up from last year's program, but someone asked, uh, how are the men who were settled in Uruguay doing? I believe Andy uh, spoke somewhat about people being repatriated to different or, you know, going to different countries who had been released. And uh, they were having a very hard time adjusting some of these people in, you know, the, 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 the horror doesn't end when they leave uh, Guantanamo, the very few who have been able, you know, to leave under, you know, circumstances that, um, you know, that in any way smack of, of justice. So how have those uh, experiences worked out in other countries? So the three questions on the table, and maybe we'll go to Andy, because, you know, we just heard from Shelby, the three questions in are, you know, on the coronavirus in, you know, at Guantanamo, you know, this uh, account of, you know, quote unquote, mistaken identity and, you know, how that has played out where people have been arrested who were not the people they were said they were, and then what has happened as a consequence. And then what uh, might be said about people who have resettled you know, out of the prison and uh, the difficulties and challenges that they faced. So maybe we can start with Andy and, you know, follow up um, perhaps with the coronavirus uh, from uh, Shelby. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for, uh, for your questions. Um, so um, 
I definitely I will let Shelby talk about the coronavirus. The the kind of mistaken identity issue, there certainly seem to be um, some cases in Guantanamo and, uh, you know, and some people, as I've said before, it's not mistaken identity, it's people who were alleged to have done something and then from that there was an extrapolation that it meant something more than it did. Um, one of Shelby's clients is Saifullah Paraka, who's the, the oldest prisoner in Guantanamo, um, someone who seems to be widely respected by the prisoners and by the personnel there as a kind of father figure to everybody. And he was a, he was a businessman in Pakistan, and he attended meetings, a couple of meetings, I believe, where he was introduced to Osama bin Laden. But what came out of that, and, you know, I'll try and keep these things simple, because out of that somehow came a story that he was connected with trying to facilitate things for al-Qaeda, that, you know, people were tortured, were be already being tortured by the time this information happened. By the time that he was kidnapped and taken to black sites and then brought to Guantanamo, um, people had already been tortured and under torture, people told lies. Um, but, you know, his, his son was all, um, he was actually not held at Guantanamo. His son was tried in New York and convicted on, on, um, on terrorism charges. Um, but he recently had his conviction thrown out of court by a judge. Um, on the very clear basis, when you look at why that conviction was thrown out, that there was a real problem with the evidence. And yet the son's story is tied in so much to the father's story. But what happened in the end with the son was that, and this is unique, don't get me wrong, the US man, there was a recognition within the judicial system that something had gone wrong, and he's now home in Pakistan. His father, Saifullah, is at Guantanamo, where actually nobody cares about what the truth is at Guantanamo. No one cares about right or wrong, or legality, or justice, or morality. The principle at Guantanamo seems to be that um, unless you're lucky, everything is done to keep you there and not to release you under any circumstances. And so, there is no logical knock-on effect of what happened to Saifullah's son, Uzair, that should then lead to his release. That connection there is broken somehow. Shelby can't just file a suit that would follow up on that in a court somewhere that would lead to him being released because the courts barely touch on the reality of these men's lives. You know, the, earlier I spoke about that golden period for the law of two years when the men had habeas corpus cases granted. So I feel stuck because in his parallel reality, it doesn't seem to matter whether he's innocent or not. But it did in the case of his son, eventually. And, you know, there are, there are other cases. Um, this isn't really the time to go into them, but as, as I mentioned earlier, Shelby, I really do hope that, you know, that we can work together and find other people who are interested in telling the stories of some of these men who are still held, where the, where the injustice is, is so cumulative and so shocking, I think. I think we've been through so many phases with Guantanamo. When we talk about the torture that happened in 2002, 2003, 2004, that's one thing. But now we're on this slow drip 20 year torture. Um, and where we, as soon as you go down the rabbit hole and start looking at why people are held and what the case is supposed to be against them. And I don't mean the very small number of people who are seriously accused of major crimes. I'm talking about the still ordinary prisoners that are held at Guantanamo, people that don't seem to be any kind of mastermind. As soon as you start examining it, you wonder how on earth it is that they're still in this place where freedom seems to be something that isn't even an option. Which is, you know, I suppose that is the definition of indefinite detention without charge or trial. Freedom is not an option. Just so shocking. Um, 
I don't know. I, I, I know that I addressed one of those questions there. I have a feeling there was another one, which I can't quite remember what it was now. Maybe, Shelby, you could talk about <laughs> coronavirus and then we could see if we could work out what this third one was. It was about the resettling in Uruguay and other countries. Ah, okay. Well, briefly, you know, I will just talk about it briefly because I know that Diab, who was sent to Uruguay, you know, had a terrible time and, you know, um, but, I, but I know that some of the other men, or, you know, have settled and, and are fine. It's, it was a kind of lottery, really. It was a lottery in the sense that the United States, primarily under Barack Obama, um, was desperate to find countries that would take former prisoners who couldn't be repatriated for one reason or another. Because the United States would not do it itself, the United States in initially intended to bring some Uyghurs to the US mainland, but Obama got cowardly about it. Um, imagine if that had happened. But anyway, um, it's a lottery. Some people are sent to countries where they get support. Some people are sent to countries where they don't. Some people are sent to countries where there are Muslims, other Muslims. Some people are sent to countries where there aren't. Um, it, it seems to have been so arbitrary. And what else is shocking about it? Well, just as there is no rule book in Guantanamo for what rights these people have as human beings, when they're released, there is still no rule book for what rights these people have as human beings. Um, it, all their rights are optional. They're up to their host country. They're up to the United States. They're up to the two of them talking to each other. Who knows on what basis it is? There is certainly no manual of uh, the rights that former Guantanamo prisoners have. And, you know, my long struggle um, and Shelby's and everyone who's interested in this for all of these years has been to get this wretched place closed down. Even when we get there, then comes the, the issue of how former enemy combatants can escape from the from the, the stamp of that that lives with them ever um, that you know that they we need um, to have international bodies that recognize that the wrong that was done to these people by the United States is so fundamental that it strips them of their rights as human beings anyway that's um Shelby, please tell us about the coronavirus. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. Um, I'm happy to, um, which sounds like the only wrong sentence here with regards to anything. <laughs> no one's happy to talk about corona. But um, no, I appreciate everything that you have relayed. And it's always one of the primary things that I begin conversations or panels with. Um, is a quote from my predecessor uh, slash friend, Corey, sorry, Corey Kreider. Um, and Corey, uh, I remember several quotes from her. And one of them is that uh, back in 2009, the Uyghurs were meant to be resettled in the US, as you mentioned. Um, I think it was North Carolina. And she said to me once, uh, imagine if there were photos on the front page of the New York Times of Uyghurs like swimming you know, in the waters relevant to that location um, and how everyone would just become more at peace with and, and uh, kind of learn to engage with the concept of these people being on U.S. soil as opposed to thinking that they are this weird, you know, extraterrestrial superhuman um, and if they're released from prison, unlike, you know, our relatives who get released from prison are capable of, you know, extreme damage forever and ever. Uh, imagine what life would be. Um, and you're obviously 100% correct to say that it was um, Obama's political failure, his, his refusal to take on the accountability of making that move. I remember actually when it was done, um, and I was, I didn't even have a law degree at that point, but um, that Lindsey Graham and several others in the Senate uh, had specifically spoken out against their being um, resettled in the United States. And instead of pushing back against that as the commander in chief of the military, where this was, was and continues to be and has always been a military prison, 
it's exclusively under his control and management, um, which is what, uh, what a lot of lawyers like to mention um, when there's a conversation about the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, which is the piece of litigation that purportedly limits the power of the president from, limits him from moving folks in Guantanamo to other countries in terms of finances, and also purportedly limits him moving folks in Guantanamo to the United States, whether it be to a prison for trial or just for release. Um, and, and, and that's something that the presidents, including Trump, um, I'm sure that he had an advisor at that point, uh, had, had advised him to make the same signing statement on the litigation. So, you know, laws pass through the houses and they, arrive on the president's desk and he signs them um, and signing statements are basically like his signature and then he'll write something else at the bottom and it doesn't have legal weight but they historically they the presidents have made these statements uh in anticipation of challenging whatever provisions exist and the signing statements as challenges um have thus gone you know uh, under obama he signed the NDAA of 2012, which was the first uh, National Defense Authorization Act to limit his power in that way um, of his military prison. Um, and he made a signing statement to the effect of, this is uh, an unconstitutional restriction of my power as commander in chief. Um, and, and he did so for every subsequent year um, throughout his tenure. Um, and so, so did Trump, although frankly, I'm not sure that matters one way or the other. Um, and yeah, so that, I mean, that would have been really precedential. And, and I feel like it obviously is very much um, a function of American mentality and like the understanding of, of what on earth is going on in Guantanamo. Uh, it's a direct result of the hyperbolic absurdly um, exaggerated to the point of like incredulity. Who is in Guantanamo? Uh, they are not superhumans. Um, to be honest, <laughs> this really gets me and it's a bit of a non sequitur, but I'm gonna go there. Um, the men in Guantanamo aren't allowed to see the ocean. They live on the ocean, they live on a coast and they can't see it, um, although they can right now. And the reason is, um, the reason they can see it is less important than the reason that they're not allowed to see it. The reason that they're not allowed to see it is because the, as they call it, administration, you know, those in power who are their wardens um, or those who are in power in, in Washington, D.C., much more likely, who are, you know, giving uh, orders. The concerns that if they understand the lay of the land in Guantanamo and, and, you know, the coastline, that they can somehow communicate to their terrorist counterparts that don't exist or, you know, have since died <laughs> or whatever, um, to, you know, come save them via submarine or some other water-based mechanism. And it sounds insane because it's insane. Um, basically, they're they're not viewed as regular. You know, you talk about like Jeffrey Dahmer or some sort of like mass murderer, um, and they are are viewed as humans. And the men that I represent, because they're brown, are, are viewed as superhuman. Um, you know, they're going to tunnel under the ground and somehow make it out to the water if they if they can see the water from a distance, like if they just see it you know, it's all over. It's going to be some sort of like um, prison break, right? Shawshank Redemption style. That's insane. I think we can all agree that's insane. Um, and, and the true thing is, I don't know whether it is their morbid fear of the other, or if it is in fact, um, like a misunderstanding about human capacity or in the third worst case, uh, it's that 
that's a false um, cause. You know, they're not actually trying to do that. They, they think that that's as silly as we all think. Um, and what they're really trying to do is ruin their lives because a lot of these men, well, first off, they're human, right? And to be able to view an ocean when you are, for the most part, viewing four cement walls um, is important to a human, no matter where you're from or what you do. Um, and then if you add in the fact that a lot of these men, about 50% throughout, have been from Yemen and they, they've never seen a sea, um, to know that it's there, to be able to hear it and understand it and not see it, um, it's like blatant cruelty. Um, I don't feel like I'm overstepping by making that assumption as like the annoying lawyer who doesn't feel like they can say words like, no, it's quite the blatant cruelty. Um, and sorry, I realize that I've gone, uh, gone off from the actual topic. Um, with regard to, ah, uh, um, Uzair and Saifula Paracha. Um, so Saifula is the 73 year old, detainee who's the eldest that um, Andy mentioned, um, and his son, whose name is Uzair, was convicted of material support of terrorism in New York City. Um, I know both of them very well. Saifullah is my client, Uzair is my friend. Um, it is beyond insane that there is no mechanism, as Andy said aptly, there is no legal mechanism for us to contest the basis of his detention based on the exoneration of his son, whose detention was integrally linked to his own. Um, Saifullah Karacha's name was mentioned in Uzair's, um, you know, detention documents, every legal filing, they were integrally related. It wasn't uh, as though the allegations were 100% separate. Um, and, and it was overturned on the basis of a particular judge, Stein, in New York City, who had the presence of mind, um, according to Uzair's prompting, frankly, um, to review the case and to look at it for its merits and understand that in the years subsequent to Uzair's conviction, which was I think in 2004 or so, um, in the years after that, um, the CSRTs and the ARBs of Guantanamo, which is to say the administrative processes that discussed the, the challenges to detention and, and sometimes detainees weren't even given access to these things, but it's kind of um, the administrative processes that existed before Obama. So these are kind of ancient. Um, that in those things, uh, the particular quote witnesses who are high value detainees didn't claim to know these men. They had professed responsibility for having orchestrated 9-11 and I'm not exaggerating, that's actually what was done. Um, and then they named more than 25 people and the people who were not named were the Parachas. And that's in a particular case of KSM, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. And then in another case, um, it was specifically uh, disclaimed as in um, the high value detainee, the man who's living in Guantanamo, who is may or may not be likely associated with Guantanamo, uh, sorry, with 9-11. Um, I'm not, to be honest, certain of his level of con mm, his legal standing right now. Um, he, he, of the two individuals, he being the second, uh, specifically admitted to n not having to knowing who they were and assessing them as not trustworthy to Al Qaeda. Um, and that's enormous, uh, I think. And thank God a US judge was willing to listen and look at that. I mean, I don't hold a, a ton of faith in the US justice system as a lawyer, um, as a lawyer of defendants, of indigent clients, of immigrants. Um, but I do hold much more faith in our 
flawed justice system than I do of the non-existent one in Guantanamo. Um, and his son spent 15 long years, wasted 15 years of his life. He's pretty much as old as I am. I'm 34 and he's 35 or six. Um, he wasted most of his life uh, in prison because we made a mistake and didn't get any compensation. Not only was he, um, was the conviction overturned, but the U.S. Justice Department decided not to pursue another conviction, which is their option. Um, and I sat with his father, uh, having talked to his son, where his, his son was the main reason that Uzair decided to, you know, fight for his own freedom is because he felt like his own detention was impugning his father, was keeping his father in Guantanamo, which is heartbreaking. And I understand it logically, but, you know, to the extent that that's, you know, one shouldn't ever think that of themselves. And, and you, you're, his, his uh, detention wasn't a reflection upon himself or, or anything really he didn't control it we controlled it um but at the same time that is what propelled him further um and Saif had a, a prb hearing which is as andy said the administrative review process that i just kind of pishawed a minute ago but it's it's the one that obama implemented in march 2011 and then actually started doing things in uh, November 2013 um, and has been in effect since. It's been quite stalled under Trump with very tiny exceptions, but for the most part, it's been ineffective under Trump. Um, and Saifullah has recently had a hearing and we're waiting to hear on the results of that. We're, we're for the most part praying that uh, the powers that be wait until the new administration takes office um in order to pass any decisions as they did annoyingly uh which is a real understatement what, what the administration did when trump took office there were five cleared men in guantanamo of 41 at the time now 40 um and two of them were um two of the five were cleared to return to their countries of origin who were on good terms with the United States, being Algeria and Morocco, um, both of whom are my current clients. And the Secretary of Defense at the time, uh, Obama Secretary of Defense decided to defer to the incoming administration. Um, so to say, pass the buck, um, which probably is the saddest thing that's happened to anyone ever um, because my clients thought they were going home and I told them they were going to go home. And now we're all just sort of waiting on the edge of Biden's inauguration. And I didn't talk about COVID, but sorry. <laughs> I do have a response with regard to COVID. Well, I think um, we've heard so much and learned so much, you know, tonight. And um, uh, I want to, you know, say a few things more about revolution books and call on people to support revolution books because tonight's program or late afternoon and for Andy, it's late at night. Um, but, you know, the program today really underscores the vital need for this bookstore and the role that it plays. And, uh, you know, we can't uh, survive and we can't flourish without, you know, the support of the people who are watching this and the people who are watching this who have the friends and their colleagues and we have to reach far and wide you know to build support for this unique um you know bookstore as i said this is a bookstore that is a beacon for a whole new world and um you know people can donate i want to make very clear you know that they can donate um by going to uh, revolutionbooksnyc.org uh, they can donate uh, through Venmo, that's at Rev, and they can also donate through the Cash App, which is the dollar sign, uh, Rev Books NYC. Um, you know, the same system, you know, which has waged this capitalist imperialist system, which has waged these endless wars and set up these military bases around the world in the Guantanamo, 
you know, has also just shown its utter bankruptcy in dealing with the twin pandemics of COVID, you know, and uh, fascism, you know, 400,000 people have died uh, most unnecessarily uh, through this COVID uh, pandemic. And um, on January 6th, we saw this attempted fascist coup, you know, with these, uh, you know, this violent attempt to put, you know, Trump back in office to keep him in office. And uh, those people were raising the banners of racism, slavery, and genocide. And uh, at Revolution Books, we have the discussions, the, you know, the books, and we get into science versus conspiracy theory and understanding diseases like um, AIDS, HIV AIDS and uh, COVID. We have deep discussion and forums and the films of Bob Avakian that go deep into the roots of fascism you know, in this society uh, going back you know, the direct line from the Confederacy to now and what it is in the, in, the, in, the, in the challenges and in the functioning of this system that call forth this fascist program and, um, you know, and what we've seen in the streets with these uh, lunatic mobs. And, um, you know, this was also a year, 2020, when we saw this incredibly beautiful uprising against institutionalized systemic racism and uh, murder by police. And we were shut down by the COVID epidemic, but we had sidewalk discussions in front of the store about you know, what underlay this uprising, where it needs to go. And we had discussions of Baba Vakian's article, racial oppression can be ended under this system. Racial oppression can be ended, but not under this system. And you know, we need to make a revolution to put an end to racism and to patriarchy and to all the horrors of this system. And uh, the revolution that we're talking about is a revolution to emancipate all of humanity and a revolution to change everything. And there is no revolution without the imagination. You know, and Nicole Fleetwood, the art historian, she did a program a few months back at Revolution Books, a virtual program with her book, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration. We're talking about Guantanamo, we're talking about the system of mass incarceration, systemic incarceration of people of color. And in the midst of those dungeons, people were, have been creating wondrous works of art. And Nicole Fleetwood came to present you know, that book. And we have great plans for the coming year. Uh, we are going to expand and improve our online uh, commerce site. And you can get, you know, a wide array of books, you know, tremendous breadth of books that you uh, find curated here on this site. And you can also get, and I'm going to hold this up. Let me make sure I got it in the right spot here. The Constitution for the New Socialist Republic of North in North America. This constitution was written by Bob Avakian, and this is uh, the vision and the blueprint for a liberatory society. The pol politics, the economics, the legal structures of a truly liberatory society that is aiming to put an end to all oppression and exploitation. And the first act of this new socialist republic based on a revolution to overthrow this system when the conditions are right to do so, when millions rise up to put an end to all oppression, that its first act will be to totally dismantle the network of military bases the US has around the world. This will be one of its first acts. And, you know, we are talking about a revolution, as I said, to free all of humanity. So, you know, we are going to be improving our online site and you can go right now to the chat box to get books, uh, you know, to get this constitution, to get the book Basic by Baba Bakian, which is a handbook for making revolution, you know, in our time. We are going to be taking out the American crime series of articles, which appear uh, 
in Revolution, Revcom.us, which recount the 100 greatest crimes of this empire, of this system, including Guantanamo. And people can go online uh, to Revcom.us and look at American crime case number 54, the Guantanamo torture chamber to get more background and, you know, elaboration, you know, and have a reference point to go along with everything people have heard and learned uh, tonight. Um, and we are going to be doing lots of work with this book, Basics, from the talks and writings of Bob Avakian. This is that handbook, as I said, we're having discussion groups, we're gonna be taking this along with the American Crime Series into schools. So we have a lot of ambitious ideas for the coming year and this whole effort, you know, counts on your involvement, depends on your involvement and your support. And again, I wanna invite you, encourage you and urge you to make a donation to this bookstore. It is essential to our survival, our ability to flourish. We are a nonprofit, all volunteer bookstore. So make your donation, go to revolutionbooksnyc.org and spread the word of this bookstore in your social media and uh, at work virtually, uh, in your neighborhoods. Let people know about Revolution Books. It is a bookstore for the people of Harlem, for the people of New York, for the people around this country. And it is fundamentally and first and foremost, a bookstore for the people of the world because this is a bookstore about the world for a radically different world. And it's here where people discover the way out of the madness of this world in the work and leadership of Bob Avakian and the new communism that he has brought forth. So with that, I would like to call on our two speakers uh, to make closing remarks because uh, we've covered a lot of ground. And I do wanna say that we've gotten comments of thanks and appreciation from our viewers and people will be able to watch this again and also to let others know when they go to revolutionbooksnyc.org, this will be posted in the next few days. Um, I'd like to ask Andy and uh, Shelby to make any closing uh, remarks or uh, comments that they'd like to share with the audience. And on behalf of the staff of the store, I just want to thank you so deeply for what you've shared with us, what you've brought to life. And uh, it is a call for all of justice-minded, conscience-stricken people who have a heart for humanity and who do not want this prison, this atrocity to be perpetuated in their name to say, this prison must be closed now. And you have provided us with deep understanding of the history and the current day horror that is this prison. So please end out the program with any comments you'd like to make and we will have you back again because this is what Revolution Books brings to the world. Andy? Yeah. <laughs> you were on mute for a second. I was, oh, yeah. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you, Revolution Books. Thank you, Shelby, for being part of this. Um, this is now the point at which I'm really wishing that, um, that this wasn't virtual because it's, you know, it's so nice hanging out together after going through the shared emotional experience of something like this. But uh, I hope people find it as powerful as I did. And I hope that people will continue to get, um, to get involved this year. Um, so from my, from my perspective on that, if you want to know um, my contributions to it, then, then my website, Andy Worthington, and also closeguantanamo.org. Um, but just keep looking for Guantanamo and checking out what is happening with organizations because we have had a deaf presidency for, for four years. Donald Trump did not want to hear anything, so he didn't. We're now back to 
business as usual in all the terrible ways that this is this will be a Wall Street loving warmongering administration in so many ways but they recognize and accept some of the norms of international politics and diplomacy so you know my friends in the states will now be telling me honestly get the British MPs involved if British MPs are critical of what is happening at Guantanamo the administration will pay some attention to that. These things have happened in the past. I'm hoping that the EU, that the Council of Europe, that the United Nations, that all of these bodies will start to find that there is some kind of response from, from within the United States government after four years of nothing. Uh, and so within the United States, we need to work out how we can amplify our voices because we know that unfortunately, this has become a, a, a much ignored issue. Um, and yet the screaming injustice at the heart of Guantanamo is as horrific as it always has been. Um, so thank you very much to everyone who's come along to this virtual event tonight. And let's keep working to getting this place closed once and for all. Um, yeah, here, here. Uh, Andy, I first and foremost com completely relate to uh, wishing that this had been in person. Um, inshallah, that will happen soon in the coming years. Um, coming years, God, uh, I meant months, but maybe I was just Freudian slipping. Um, because it is emotional and it does matter. And, you know, um, just hearing any kind of response, which I really do appreciate, that is it's outrage like to, to hear the sound of outrage in response is so fortifying it is so inspiring um it really is and and it sounds silly and and it sounds like it shouldn't be necessary and i wish it weren't but it is it's necessary generally uh to inspire others around you your family friends whomever um it's also it's also necessary to those of us on the receiving end of it, like people who've made it their lives, careers, um, major, uh, you know, everything. They've like dedicated so much time to it um, because we, for the most part, and I'm, I don't mean to speak for Andy, but we, for the most part, <laughs> acknowledge that we are operating within a vacuum um, and it's very difficult to get publicity or attention and you know to the extent that uh public attention is measured by a media responsiveness to us it, when we engage with for example um you know the ap or u.s news or something um it's gotten a lot more difficult to get people's attention because apparently you know five years of illegal detention is more newsworthy than 19 going on 20. Um, and it's heartbreaking. And those of us who do this all the time and immerse ourselves in it are completely in need of the same support that our clients are. Um, and our clients also receive this type of support. I mean, I have taken an annoying amount of screenshots of this, even though usually it's um, that I've stolen photos from uh revolution books and their website or or whomever is um smart enough to be taking a record of what's going on and that people care and that they have uh coherent and articulate opinions and about what we're doing um and they want to help or, or they're outraged for them and that i feel is without a price um i mean i spoke to a man today who I won't name, um, who basically told me he couldn't guarantee his presence beyond our next phone call in February um, because he didn't see a reason to live anymore, but he begged me to make his story known, make his mental suffering known. He's no longer in control of his own actions. Um, I think actually on second thought, he would appreciate my sharing his name. His name is um, Zachariah Albadani. Um, and Zachariah has suffered so thoroughly over so many years. 
Um, the allegations against him at their very worst include attendance at a training camp in Georgia. Um, most people can't even place Georgia on a map, but that's neither here nor there. Um, what is, though, is that the allegations are, are so minimal, and, and we, I think every day we encounter folks, um, when I say I represent people in Guantanamo, they think the most recent thing actually from a doctor of mine was uh, bin Laden's helpers. And I think to myself, not, not apt, but also really wrong, um, completely wrong. Uh, and I get why they think that. And I understand, and I'm not trying to judge it. I think that it's media's fault. I think it's the fault of the predominant culture. Um, I think, you know, um, it's just not popular enough. And, and part of the problem, of course, is that there's no constituency. So when we go and we, we lobby Congress people and, you know, Andy comes every year and we try to sit down with um, senators and whomever will meet with us. Uh, part of the issue is that we don't have the constituency of people who are directly impacted by our completely illegal and moral actions. And the same goes for drone strikes and every... Um, international act of war, frankly. Um, and that, that is the problem. So I'm so incredibly grateful to be able to share with you what I have, um, what I have shared, and I'm happy to continue to do so. Well, thank you again for coming and we look forward to having you back soon uh, in person, uh, but we're gonna be communicating through all the means available to us and to raise this call that this prison, this torture colony must be shut down now. So thank you again. And people can come to revolutionbooksnyc.org to get resources. And uh, we'll see everyone again. That's it. Good night.